Good morning everyone and welcome to Blissful Literati. Today we are going to learn how to speak. Well, not exactly, but um, today we are going to talk about sentences, how to give voice to our thoughts, the proper way to communicate ourselves, ask a question maybe, or understand those orders from our teachers and parents, and learn how to request them for something or perhaps simply wish our friend luck good luck i mean but in a proper way so without further introduction let's dive right into the definition of sentences when a group of words come together in a logical coherent manner in a proper way sit side by side to mean something to convey our thoughts in a proper way. They are called together a sentence. Now, for example, you can ask for water by saying, please bring me a glass of water. That is one way to ask for it. Or maybe you are typing something on your computer or playing on your PC and you simply uh, just look up for a microsecond and say, water. The person will understand what you want. But perhaps that is not a correct way to ask for it. I mean, suppose the person, well, he may be dumb and uh, he perhaps come with uh, something to uh, wipe some imaginary water away from the floor, perhaps, because he may have assumed that there is water on the floor and somebody may sleep if they walk unnoticed. Now, the point is, how to convey that there is no water imaginary or whatsoever on the floor but you you need to drink some water and you are asking for it the proper way would be to frame a correct grammatical sentence so that there is no room for confusion what we need to understand that you are a normal human being and you are not running karji from black standing by the window side and um, you know with your hands out palm skyward and saying what uh, like some alien or et or uh, jadu from koimilia the point is the definition sentences they demand a logical coherent sequence of words placed together so that when they come together, they mean something. Alone, they may mean something. Obviously, everything means something or the other. But alone, they may mean so many different things. But when put together, when brought together, they mean one single whole unit. So the definition would be when a group of words come together in a logical, grammatical way to create a complete and meaningful sense, they form a sentence. Now, what are the various parts of a sentence? You see, just now I said that uh, these words which come together alone, they may mean several other things. But together, they mean one whole thing. Look at yourselves or think of the human being, humankind as a whole. Alone, you are just a student belonging to some class. And if you say something, that is your personal opinion. People may not even pay any attention to you because it is only you who are speaking. But suppose if all the students of your class come together and they say the same thing but together in unison, they become one whole voice, one united voice, which will be very difficult to ignore. I hope you can understand what I'm trying to say. The words which are there in a sentence alone may mean so many different things, but together they frame one sentence. What I want to focus on is this particular thing. What do they mean when they are on their own? What do they represent? Which are the elements? What are they which we use in a sentence? So a traditionally, ideal sentence should have a subject and a verb. A sentence may also have some further elements which includes an object and 
a countryman. Now, when I say subject, do I mean English, maths, biology, chemistry, physics? No, I don't. And I don't also mean uh, the people, like a king has his subjects, all the people in his kingdom. No, I don't mean that too. By subject, I mean whoever does something in a sentence, the actor, the doer. When a sentence is framed, it is about someone or something. What the, the particular element it is about, that is the subject of the sentence. Okay, the master, verb, whatever this master does, the action, the actor and the action. Now, sometimes a sentence is complete with just these two elements. Sometimes it may take an object, it may take a complement or it may take both. Now, let's have a look at such things to understand. But even before that, let's first have the definitions of the terms that we used here. Let's have a look at it. So, subject, as I mentioned, the doer, the actor. So, the doer in a sentence or the main character around whom the whole sentence is woven. Think of the hero. Okay, uh, like Rabbe Banadi Chori. In every scene, the one point the movie was criticized on, I don't know whether it is a valid point or not, but the one point which uh, made the movie face a lot of criticism is that in every single frame, there is the face of Shah Rukh Khan. Well, I would like to think that Shah Rukh Khan is the main subject of the movie. His transformation, his sacrifice, and the whole lot of it. That is why he uh, was there in every frame of the movie and that is why we can say the movie revolves around his character, that is, he is the subject in the movie. Verb, the word in a sentence that denotes the action done or time when it is done. So, let's just briefly hint at the two things that we find here. Verb may think, verbs may mean two different things. Number one, it may denote the action done. Whatever you do, you sing, you play, you do something, um, you break something, you even go on uh, to kill something, somebody, don't do it, you will be jailed. But still, just a thought. That, or even the time, right? Like, um, you have done something, you are doing something, you did something, you will do something. So the time, present, past or future. So verb represent these two aspects. Next comes predicate. That part of any sentence which is left behind when the subject is removed from it. Imagine a whole human body. The head is the subject. The old seeing eye, the eye of Sauron, if you are a Lord of the Rings fan. But anyway, the head, if you remove it, the thinking part, the brain, which is housed inside the head, you will remove it. The remaining of the body which is left behind, that is predicate. The remaining body, I mean, you probably will find it really difficult to identify somebody with just the body, without the head. Just think of the vampires. We stake them, yes, but sometimes in some lores, Vampires are killed by removing, by hacking off their head and burning them in the sun. So you see the head is really important. Head is the subject and the remaining body part is the predicate. So that part of any sentence which is left behind when the subject is removed from it, that is predicate. And this section gives information about the subject in any sentence. But we do need a subject, right? So, let's have an example. A flock of great winged birds are flying in the sky. Now, look at this sentence. Who are flying in the sky? Who are doing something? We can see that a flock of great winged birds, they are doing something. What are they doing? They are flying. So, a flock of great winged birds, they are the doer in the sentence and so they become the subject. What are they doing? Are flying. Flying, action, time, right now. 
the present moment. So our flying becomes a verb. And predicate, remove the subject. A flock of great winged birds, remove it. Whatever remains are flying in the sky. That becomes the predicate portion. Next, we have object. The noun or pronoun in any predicate portion which receives the action is called object. See, there is an actor, all right, there is some action being done, also fine, but we do need somebody to receive the action, right? Sometimes we do need it. Ram went to Vanvas and Bharat came to receive his uh, sandals. What I mean to say is, when you do something, sometimes you need somebody to receive the fruits of it. The effect. The effect impacts somebody and whoever that effect impacts becomes the object. So the noun or pronoun in any predicate portion which receives the action is called object. However, as I said, we may need it. A sentence may have an object, but it is not essential. For example, a flock of great winged birds are flying in the sky. The birds are flying, but is there anybody to receive the fruit of it? Hell, we don't even know what is the effect of their flying. What are they doing? Creating waves, ripples of great energy? I don't know. So my point is, objects can be there, may not be there. It's not essential. But subject verb is mandatory. Predicate naturally. And we will even see that there are sentences, there can be sentences where even the subject is invisible. We can make some sense without knowing the subject properly. But verb is essential. We do need it. The most important part of any sentence is the verb, the action. Even think of it as philosophically. Who you are is not important, but what you do, well, that makes people remember you or forget you in the oblivion. You are relegated to the back of their mind and then just poof, vanish. So the action is the most important part. It can make you or it can erase you. Anyway, um, let's have some example of what I mean when a sentence may have an object but it's not essential when I say this. Let's have an example. Ram talks to Sita. Now see, the subject here is Ram because he is doing the talking. He is talking, he talks. The action is talks, fine, and to whom he talks? Sita. So the effect, the result, the fruits of his words are received by Sita. She is the object. But when I say Ram talks fast, what is the result? The result may be, I mean, we can assume that nobody understands what Ram is, Ram is saying. But is it mentioned? Do we know it for sure? No. What we know for sure is Ram talks fast, but there is nobody, literally nobody, to receive the fruits of his action, his talking. Ram might even be talking to himself. He may be a schizophrenic and he talks to himself. He may be a mad person. His wife is dead and very soon he too will leave this mortal shell and go to the heaven. So madness finally has stripped inside his brain and he talks fast like I'm doing right now. Well, I'm not mad, by the way. So basically, the point is, Ram talks fast, there is no object, and yet the sentence makes a complete sense. Moving forward, let's have a graphical guide to these various parts. Let's first have a sentence. Nobody loves a bad boy. Don't be a bad boy. Santa Claus will not leave you a gift. And right now, we really, really need some gifts. We are all locked inside our homes. We can seriously do with some gifts. So, don't be a bad boy. Now, let's divide it. Nobody, on one hand, loves a bad boy on the other. So, let's first have the first item, the head of this sentence. Nobody. What is this? Who loves a bad boy? Nobody loves a bad boy. So, 
basically nobody is the subject in this sentence the sentence is about nobody no one similarly loves a bad boy remove the head what remains it remains the predicate so loves a bad boy is predicate the head and the body next we have a bad boy what is this a bad boy is the object because you see a bad boy is receiving or not receiving the fruits of this action love people love but the fruit of it the effect of it is not received by whoever is bad so a bad boy is the object and loves is the action the verb okay the word the verb the action whose effect is not received by a bad boy only good boys receive that finally we have another word bad and that word tells us something about the boy the nature of the boy the quality of the boy the basically the quality is the boy is bad so this word which tells us about the quality of this boy is known as adjective right and i really don't think that i have to tell you what a means yes a here is an article but do you know that articles are also considered as adjectives yes they are moving on let's now classify right the sentences um we have discussed that we have we know right now that whatever we say if we say in a logical coherent fashion uh, we have sentences but we don't always say the same thing right or the or, or we don't convey the same nature of information sometimes we seek information right sometimes we uh, we give you order we ask you to bring us some information so all these things has led to a division in the whole family of uh, sentences so let's have a look at the sentence family let's imagine sentences uh, the family as a tree so the root of this tree goes into the sentences and the seed germinates and branches itself into several different category for example we have the assertive sentence what it is we will come to that shortly why rush then we have the imperative sentence and just as these two we also have interrogative sentences but it doesn't end there we have opti exclamatory sentences and optative sentences now let's talk about these sentences but even before that even before that you see here we have only one kind of classification but modern grammarians and even in some books which you follow you will find a different kind of uh, classification namely you won't find this particular optative sentence in there how do they classify sentences let's have a look at that they classify sentences as statements which is basically the same as assertive questions which is basically the interrogative sentences now comes the twist they have a particular category called desires which includes both imperative and optative sentences and finally they have exclamations which include the exclamatory sentences so as you can see the basic change is brought in the desires category both imperative and optative they come under this category why well we will talk about that when we discuss the sentences in their own places but right now let's start with assertive sentence assertive look at the root of this word the root is assert to assert something to you know to declare something to give us some information to tell something basically so that is assertive sentence right now i am speaking in assertive sentences why because i am simply giving you informations right i am conveying something so i am using assertive sentences but suppose you were in the class i would naturally first convey the information and then i would ask you do you understand do you understand what i say right now so what would i do i will ask you something 
ask you questions to verify whether you have understood it or not. And the moment I ask you something, I move away from the assertive sentence category. I move away to the questions. Okay. So, remember assertive sentences always assert, declare, give information. Right. They don't ask or do anything else. Sentences which state something or declare anything, they are called assertive. They simply affirm or deny something and hence can further be divided into two categories. Now, when I say they simply affirm or deny, you must have gazed what those two categories might be. If they affirm, then they say yes. If they deny, then they say no. So basically, assertive sentences can be classified into two further categories which are affirmative which affirms something and negative which denies something. Sun rises in the east. Very good. Well and good. We can verify that. So it is affirmative. It is affirming a fact which is already there given. Sun does not rise in the west. Again, we are using a negative sentence. We are using the word not. We are denying West the right to have sunrise that belongs only to the East side. Or we may even say the sun does not rise in the East. We are denying a given fact. We are making it negative which also puts our knowledge about our general knowledge in some, under some negative light. People may think that, well, this person is a bit mad or fool, dumb maybe. I mean, everybody knows the sun rises in the east. Is a fool. So affirmative, to affirm something. Negative, to deny something. Now let's talk about some examples. The sky is blue. Birds are flying. You see, we are affirming. Birds are flying. We see that like Ramakrishna once stood beside this uh, lake or river maybe in his village and there was uh, there was this troop of swans flying in the sky and he observed that and maybe he said something like this. Birds are flying. Or Newton, when he was sitting under a tree and this apple suddenly fell on his head, he said, apple falls. Right. Anyway, so these are affirmative sentences which assert something. Apple falls. Yes, there is gravity after all and well, thank Newton, he gave us gravity. Um, really? Okay, fine. You know everything. Gravity was already there. He just gave us the concept of it. The sky is blue. Another fact. We can all see it. Yes, it is a fact. So we are affirming a fact. Yes, somebody did say the sky is pink and that's why it was transformed into a movie. It affirms sky is pink. It affirms uniqueness in everybody. That is also affirmative. Every single individual is unique with their own ideas, concepts, notions, beliefs. We should always affirm everything. Right? We should give every voice a chance to be heard, to be, to be expressed. We should not deny them of anything. They should not complain. Okay? We were not given this opportunity to prove ourselves. But sometimes we do need to use negative sentences. For example, in your exam, if you don't get good grades, the teacher may say that the student is not studying well. Negative you know, remark about your uh, academics. What will that do? That will uh, inform your parents about what you're doing and they may take care that so that you can study hard properly and bring good credits. So for example, the girl is not going to school. We have not completed the task yet. So basically when we want to make an assertive sentence negative, we bring the word not in it. Not along with the verb. The auxiliary verb is not, have not. And suppose there is no auxiliary verb. So what we do then? 
do we say the girl not going to school the girl not go to school no we don't say that what we do we do one insertion we bring do insertion that is we bring do verb in it the girl does not go to school right so anyway we will come to that later just remember we use not or any form of no negative to make a sentence negative let's have a look at these people okay what they are doing for example look at this woman this lady she is such downcast why she says i feel tired right she is informing us she is giving a statement she looks like that because she is tired or perhaps this fellow he is so confused why and he says i don't remember it maybe he is he has misplaced his keys or maybe his iphone or perhaps his books or maybe the password to his account games and whatsoever whatever it is he doesn't remember it so again he is giving us a statement finally there is this lady who looks uh, so far as her dress code goes a doctor is she yes she says i am a doctor so she is waving at us and introduce and introducing herself she says she is a doctor right so she is again giving a statement right so all these are assertive sentences they state something they declare something they inform something right they don't ask questions they don't uh, tell us what to do they simply state some facts moving on to the interrogative sentences now when i said that assertive sentences only declare something they don't um they don't let us ask something they, they don't tell us to do something that leaves a room open it is very well fine for the teacher to give you all the information load you overload you with all the information but suppose you don't understand something will you simply say i don't understand or will you pinpoint the exact thing which you didn't understand and ask the teacher to repeat that to explain that in a different manner i mean that would really be helpful for the teacher as well and that is where this interrogative sentences come in they help us to ask questions you don't understand something you ask questions about it remember uh, no probably you won't remember probably you haven't seen any but if you go to um, youtube and search for the tata docomo ads there will be a tagline this was the tagline for tata docomo puchne mein kya hai what harm is there in asking and what harm could be there in learning about interrogative sentences or how to ask questions properly so the sentences which ask a question or inquire about anything are called interrogative sentences based on the tone they can be divided into two categories again but before i go into the two categories which well you already know what those categories might be let me tell you something about the term you see interrogative sentences not necessarily need to have a one question mark structure we will have a separate session on framing questions that is interrogative sentences but let me give you one hint you can simply say something right you can simply say something but depending on your tone it can come out as a statement or it can come out as a question for example you can say i understand or you can say i understand you see the rising intonation in the second sentence makes it sound like a question i understand your question you think i understand do i the actual question would be do i understand but i simply repeat i understand right so that is interrogative sentence which may not have a traditional structure but for now right here we will talk about the traditional structure you see you should know the rules first before you go on breaking them 
right? You should know what you are dealing with before you start messing with all those things or the things will mess with you and you will be messy, not in a good way, right? So the two different categories, positive interrogative and negative interrogative. Again, asking something by yes or asking something by no. For example, have you seen it? Yes, no, whatever could be the answer, but the question is in positive interrogative. Have you seen it? Do you know him? There is no room for no or not in these questions. But who doesn't love their country does not. See, there is this negative element in this question. Did you not hear what I said? Again, straight, not. Did you not hear? Didn't you hear? If I use contraction, by the way, didn't you hear what I said? At any rate, not. You can use again. See, the very important role that not plays. Take any sentence. Assertive, interrogative, whatever. Put one not in it. It will become negative. So, that is the significance of knowing not and even in life it is very important to know when to say no we should learn that you see we all have our own life own work to do if you keep saying yes 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 to everything you become a yes man and that is really damaging for your personality you should also learn how to say no and when to say no and how to stick to it. If somebody asks for some, you know, um, some favor which is not really good in nature, you should always say no. You should always say no when you don't really know the answer to some questions. And this is really very important for us teachers. If we don't know something, we must say no. We can even add that I will tell you afterwards, but it is always better to accept that I may not know something than to load our students with wrong information. So the importance of not is not just in the sentence types, grammar. The importance of not is there in our life as well. We should all learn how to say no. Now let's have a look at again some people. The doctor comes back. Did I forget something? Well, she has definitely forgot to uh, put on her mask, I think, uh, during this uh, COVID-19 times. Uh, definitely she has forgotten something. And here is the policeman. He is what? What is, what is he saying? Didn't you see the red light? Okay, so he is surprised that even now, when the roads are really empty and people can see far, far ahead because there are no cars almost in front of them, how could these people miss the red light? Didn't you see the red light? Question. Note the use of do insertion and the question mark. When there are no auxiliary verbs in a sentence, to make it interrogative or negative, we make this do insertion. We bring the appropriate form of do verb. And by appropriate form, I mean three particular forms. Do for present, did for past, as you can see here, and does for present, but third person, singular number. He, she, it, or any name. Moving on to the next part. Now we come to imperative sentences. Imperative sentences are those sentences well, you see, we have already said something. We have already asked our questions as well. In a classroom, you have done your share. Now what do you need to do? You need to bunk the class. You need to get out of it. Your friend from another section is going to the washroom. You see it and you raise your hand and ask for permission. Request the teacher. And there comes the imperative sentence. Requesting something. Or the teacher may order you to do something, to submit your assignment. Maybe it's long due, so the teacher now orders you to submit it immediately. That is imperative. 
Sentences which are used to indicate some command, request, or advice are called imperative sentences. Imperative sentences can only be in simple present or present indefinite tense. And based on their nature, they can be of two categories. Again, I am not going to say it. I am not going to say it. You know, right? Yes? Okay, fine. Uh, how else will you answer right here? I will say it. Positive imperative and negative imperative. For example, open the door. Come here. You see, I am ordering you to open the door. I am ordering you to come here. There is no request, no advice. Okay. Plain and simple order. And then, do not go there. I am forbidding you. Using a negative imperative. Do not raise your voice. Your teacher, your father may say it. And they are using a negative imperative. Try to disobey them. And you know what can happen. Else we can say, please bring me a glass of water. Please keep up the grass. So here we are adding this element of request. We are saying, please, please do this. Please do that. You see, please keep off the grass. It has a negative sense. Yes, I am asking you not to do something. But as sentence, it is positive. Because there is no negative element in the sentence directly. The sense is negative. But the element, negative element, not, is not there. For that, we need to bring something like do not go there, do not raise your voice. We need to bring this not element. What I am trying to say is that in imperative sentence or in any kind of sentence, there can, the sense can be negative, especially in imperative sentence. Let's have some more examples. Please lower the volume of the TV. Don't raise it, basically. Lower the volume, negative sense. Please maintain social distancing. Here it is positive, but again, we can think of it as a negative element because it forbids us from getting cozy ourselves. Right, so as I want, to, want you to understand is that Sentences can be negative actually or sentences can have a negative sense but again then also come out as positive. So that is essential. For example, we can have a look at these people now. First this old man and see stop the noise like all these old people are. They can't bear this loud noise you know and at their age we can only imagine. Just look at the babies. You make a loud noise, the baby will start crying. The old people, they won't cry. Well, not in front of us, but they can rebuke us. Stop the noise. And a teacher might ask you, please be quiet. Well, she might ask that at the beginning of the class, but let her roll on and then you will see. Request can immediately, as well, easily becomes order and then it may, well, lead to some kind of you know chiding all those things if as one poet has said if winter is there can spring be far behind so if request is there can order be far behind especially when we are talking about teachers and finally we have another old man who is waving at us maybe and tells us to follow him okay so again you see follow me can be taken as an order or maybe an advice Otherwise, we may get lost in the big city. So these are all imperative sentences. Next, we come to the optative sentence. Now, remember, both imperative sentences and optative sentences were coming under the category of desires. Now, optative sentence is basically desire sentences. That is clear. Desire what we wish, what we want. So we can wish you luck for your coming exams. We can wish you luck for your coming assignment or the next mission or multiplayer game or whatever. We can wish you anything. You can wish upon a uh, shooting star even. So that is optative sentence for you where you express your desires. Now how imperative sentence fits in this role? You see when I'm asking water from you, telling you bring me a glass of water, actually I have this desire to drink water. So, that is expressed through this imperative sentence. When I say, follow me, 
what I desire, what I wish for is that you will follow me. So, imperative sentences in a way express desires. So, the other type of classification which sees sentences divided into four categories club both imperative and optative sentences in the desire category. But what we need to understand is even though they may suggest the same kind of thing, their construction or mode is slightly different. Imperative sentences can be directly divided into um, order, request or advice while optative sentences express only desires, wishes. So sentences which express some kind of wish are called optative sentences and based on the nature of the wish, they can give two categories, positive optative and negative optative. For example, may God bless him, may he live long. So positive imperative, we want some positive things. God bless you, my son. May the king live long, may the queen live long. So may he live long. We are expressing our positive desires. On the other hand, we may also say, may he not suffer any longer. I wish he doesn't hear this. Trust me. Trust me. If you think somebody should not hear something, try your best to keep that away from the person because that may land you into huge trouble. Trust me. Similarly, somebody is suffering from a disease perhaps, some illness, some pain. So pray to God that not to lengthen his suffering, release him of it. If he is not going to get better, if there is no cure for him, at least let him die in peace. A calm death, at least. That much he deserves. So may he not suffer any longer. I wish he doesn't hear this negative optative sentences. Now, again, let's look at this lady. Um, she is really in a cheerful mood. And why is that? Wish you a great success ahead, she says. Okay, so she is wishing us luck um, and I think we can all do with some kind of luck uh, right now because as uh, I heard latest, the board exams, 10th and 12th, the dates are almost announced, fixed and uh, the students will be giving the exams very soon, maybe in uh, the next month perhaps. So they do need good luck. They do need this success. May the king live long. This great man announces, may the king live long. Great. So yes, he is a staunch supporter of the king, whoever he may be. And with this, let's move on to the next category, which is exclamatory sentences. Exclamatory sentences are used, as you can see from the name, exclamatory comes from exclaim, our exclamations. So exclamatory sentences are used to indicate some kind of surprised exclamation and they often make use of the interjections. Interjections, if you remember parts of speech, that hush or alas, hurrah, all those things, those are interjections. So uh, for exclamatory sentences, for example, we have what a wonderful sight, exclamation mark, how nice, exclamation mark, note the interjection, Alas, exclamation mark, he is no more. So these are exclamatory sentences. For example, let's have another example. How beautiful the painting is. So these are exclamatory sentences which exclaim something. The exclamation may be uh, of surprised emotion. The exclamation is always of surprised emotion. But the surprise may be positive. It may be negative. What a wonderful sight. It is a positive explanation. We are really, you know, enthused to see the sight. We really enjoy it. It is really nice. How nice. But it is also negative. It can be negative. Alas, he is no more. We are surprised. We are shocked. More than surprised, the word should be, we are shocked to hear this. That he is, whoever he is, no more. We miss him. It's a terrible day. It's a terrible news. So, negative element. How beautiful the painting is, again, a positive element. So, elements are also important. 
Now let's have a look at these fine people. Okay, long live the king, this man said, and perhaps the king is dead. Alas, he is no more, and so he says, Alas, I am undone. The one he supported is there no more. Sorry, brother, we feel for you, but can't be helped. And then we have this fine lady, a museum, I think, curator or guide, perhaps, and see what she's saying. What a wonderful painting it is. Perhaps she's standing in front of Mona Lisa smiles and pointing at that enigmatic smile and saying, What a wonderful painting it is. Right. So these are the exclamatory sentences. Now, moving on to the sentence identifiers. See, we have already discussed all the types of sentences, the five types, or if we even consider the four categories, then all those types we have discussed. Now, it is essential for us to understand how to identify a sentence. Suppose a question may come, okay, identify the sentences and there are some uh, words put together to mean something, something or the other. But those words can be sentences, those words can be just random words put together. So, how to identify? First of all, sentences always begin with a capital letter. So, error correction for your class. Sometimes we can give you a whole paragraph with these errors in between. After a full stop, there is no capital letter. So you need to put the capital letter there to make it correct. Assertives, imperatives and optatives, they always end with a full stop. So again, remember punctuation. We will come to that chapter again. But remember, punctuation is very important. I understand. Assertive, Full stop. I understand. Question mark. Integrative. So you see, assertive, imperative, and optative, they always end with a full stop, and interrogative sentences end with a question mark, just as exclamatory sentences end with a question mark. So with these, even you can identify the different types of sentences. Finally, before we uh, call it a day, let's have a collective comprehensive look at the different sentence types their formula and examples for assertive sentence we have the subject then we use verb and then the object predicate portion for positive sentences now operator is the time indicator am is are was where and even the do verbs do did does has have had all these verbs the modal verbs, right, can, could, shall, should, those come under the category of operators. So subject, operator, if needed, verb, must needed, object predicate portion is positive. I like ice cream. Raj is going to school. Is, in this case, is the operator. Like, simple verb, ice cream, object, okay. To school, going to school. Raj is going to school. Apart from Raj, whatever left is predicate portion. Similarly, to make it negative, we use not. The not always comes before the verb. But if there is an operator in the sentence, then it comes after the operator. So, I do not like ice cream. Raj is not going to school. So, see, verb like going not always comes before that. but after the operator do or is, do not, is not. Remember this trick always. Negative element will always come before the verb, but always after the operator. The operator includes be verb, have verb, do verb, or modal verbs. For interrogative sentences, we have the auxiliary verb. First, the verb comes at the beginning, auxiliary verb. Then comes the subject and then comes the predicate portion. For example, again the same sentence, I like ice cream, statement. Do I like ice cream? Do here is the auxiliary verb. Operators are also known as auxiliary verbs. So the same examples, be verb, have verb, do verb, or even the modal verbs which we discussed as operators are also auxiliary verbs. So do comes first. 
then subject I and then the predicate portion like ice cream is operator or auxiliary verb Raj subject and then the predicate portion going to school. Similarly, in negative, the same rule follows. First comes the operator or the auxiliary verb, then again comes the subject, then comes not and then the object predicate. This is when we are asking questions in full sentence, not when we use contractions. If we contract the sentence, then the not in apostrophe T, the contracted form, comes with the auxiliary verb. For now, the full form, do I, do auxiliary verb, then subject I, then the not, do I not, and then the predicate, like ice cream. Is Raj not going to school? But if I use contracted form, isn't Raj going to school? See, not in apostrophe T comes with is and then comes the subject. So th here is this minor change. It is not uh, too much of difficulty. One can easily grasp it. Comes imperative now. So first, the request or suggestion indicator. Please let then the verb in its infinitive form, the first form, bare infinitive, technical word. What I actually mean is the basic root form of the verb and then object predicate if needed. You see here in this kind of sentences, imperative sentences, the request or the suggestion indicator, that is please, let, they are not mandatory. I mean, if you're ordering somebody to do something, why would you uh, say please to him or let to him right that makes no sense similarly if come does the work go does the work then why say extra words why waste extra words so even the object predicate portion is not essential not mandatory we may use it but we may do without it keep off the cross see keep bare infinitive form the basic root form keep Kept, kept. We are using the first form, keep, the basic root form, which is also known as bare infinitive form, and then the object predicate, the predicate portion of the cross. Please stop the music. Here we use the request element, please, and then the verb in its root form, stop. We don't say stopped, we don't say stopping, we don't say stops. We use the basic root form, stop. Please stop the music. For negative, we use the not element. Do not. For example, do not keep off the grass. Please do not stop the music. So not element is used. And at the same time, we also use the bare infinitive form. Keep or stop. Right. Next comes the optative sentence. In this case, again, the may or wish element is there. So, first, in place of request or suggestion as in imperative sentences, we use the may or wish form. So, may or wish, then the subject, and then we use the bare infinitive verb form, and then we use the predicate portion. May the dragon queen rule the seven kingdoms. Well, you will understand this if you have watched or uh, read the Game of Thrones. Anyway, wish you become successful in life. So, you see may or wish and then the subject, dragon queen, then the bare infinitive verb, rule, and then the predicate portion. May the dragon queen does not rule the seven kingdoms, negative, we use the not element again. Wish you do not become successful in life, the do or does form, inclusion, right? Finally comes the exclamatory sentence. We use the interjection if needed, then the basic exclamations, what or how. Then we give the main idea and then the subject and verb. What an idea it is. What we use that. Then the main idea, the basic thing, an idea, a beautiful picture. The subject it and the verb is with exclamation mark. Usually there is no negative exclamatory sentences. The sense may be negative, but usually there isn't. Yes, alas, he is no more. We can make it negative, but again. In that case, follow the same thing. The not will come in its place. So, I hope you have understood these uh, sentences really well and 
from starting from now on, you will all go out in the world speaking perfectly correct English sentences. If you make any mistake, you can always come back, go through the video again, and ask, leave any comment, any question you have, and we will surely get back to you with the answers. Till then, thank you. Bye bye.